Indeed, the Lord is our salvation. Please be seated in the presence of the Lord who saves us and redeems us. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, I'm okay with this church. Uh, those of you watching online, following us online as well, good morning to you as well. And welcome to our Good Friday worship service, 10 a.m. this morning. As we continue to contemplate and meditate on the significance of Christ's death on the cross, it's not a new message per se. We all know that Jesus died on the cross for us. But have we truly meditated and pushed the limits of what this truly means for all of us? And so I've entitled today's sermon, The Reward of His Suffering. The Reward of Christ's Suffering. Let's pray as we begin and ask the Lord to grant us a greater and grander vision of the cross. O Lord, magnify, magnify yourself in our eyes. Forgive us for the many times we have veiled the truth by our own sinful ways or neglect. Lord Holy Spirit, remove these veils from our eyes. Anything that is clouding our vision of you and the cross, we pray you take them away. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I think by now, almost everyone should already know I contracted COVID-19 right at the start of the month of March. Thank you for your prayers. By God's grace, I've recovered more or less fully. I resumed some kind of running, not as fast as last time, but at least can resume some kind of exercise. I had 11 days of positive experience, ART positive, <laughs> right? And then uh, another two weeks, three weeks plus of uh, long COVID, post-COVID symptoms. What I'm thankful is that my immediate family members didn't have to go through what I went through. The pain of going through that positive experience, you know, all the symptoms. Uh, somehow I managed to isolate from them so they didn't catch uh, the virus for me. The only physical challenge I faced during this period of isolation was sleeping on a mattress on the hard floor. <laughs> That's the way I isolated myself and the rest of the family members. I put myself in the living room on the hard floor on the mattress. And so when I woke up for the first few mornings, I didn't know whether it was the virus in me or the hard floor. You know, body ache, you know, after a certain age, I tell you, those of you younger ones, after 40, definitely you will have body aches. So I went, oh, I don't know this body ache because of the virus on the floor. Likely it's both, right? So we feel that kind of uh, pain as we grow older. But like I said, thankful, uh, the rest of the family members were protected from this sickness. I recall years ago when my son was very young, especially between the ages of uh, zero to two years old, we had to go to the hospital A&E department many times for different reasons. Uh, as soon as, uh, as young as he was five months old, at that time he developed UTI, that's urinary tract infection, right? And we know typically it affects uh, ladies more than guys, but uh, so he got it anyway, even though he was a boy, he developed, it's unusual, but he got it. The episode was particularly painful for my wife Val and I because we couldn't do anything. The procedure at the time was that we had to stand outside the room and wait while the doctors and nurses try to find his vein, you know, to put a drip. We know this is already difficult for any ordinary baby, right? But my son at the time, five months old, he was weighing a whooping 10 kg. Whoa! The doctor told the nurse, cannot be, go and weigh again. <laughs> That's how chubby he was. He was the Michelin tire kind of baby, you know, Michelin tire. And so, chubby, very good, cute, right? Very unseen as parents, very comforted. But when you go to the hospital for a situation like that, it's the reverse. So it was tough and he was wailing inside the room for 30 minutes. And Val and I, we were so helpless. Oh man, we can't do anything to comfort him or to help him. Thankfully, I mean, the episode is over. Then in the course of the two years, he basically developed febrile feats three times. Uh, that's high fever you, in, as an infant or toddler and then going to a kind of feats. So the doctors told us this was also unusual. Most people, children get febrile fits at most once in their lifetime, but he had it three times and almost coincide always with healing services. Whenever we had healing services in the church, almost that time he would have something that would go wrong. And so we went to hospital many times because of these uh, febrile fits. And then when he was two years old, this time my neglect, my fault. I didn't watch him properly at the playground at the, my uh, in-laws estate. And so he fell head first onto the staircase. Bah! But thankfully, he didn't get a concussion. He didn't hit this part of his head. He hit, uh, thankfully, or not, the lips. And so the lips cut against his teeth. He had a huge gash. And so his lip was flapping. <laughs> and then blood gushing out everywhere. His stool a bit shaken. 
I carried him and his bloody shirt back home. Thankfully, Val didn't scold me. <laughs> right? And we rushed him to the hospital for, uh, for stitches. And so throughout all these episodes, there was just one lingering thought in my mind. I wish it was me, not him. I wish it was me, not him. Those of us who are parents, you probably experience this similar feeling or thought. When you see your children suffer, you are looking at them helpless. And you think to yourself, I wish it was me, not them. Those of you who had to go through a difficult journey with your spouse, going them, seeing them through a debilitating illness, at first, you know, healthy, chubby perhaps, but maybe cancer strikes, you see them losing weight, becoming more and more bony, you think to yourself, I wish it was me, not my spouse. And now in this COVID pandemic, we know that the seniors are the vulnerable group. And if you, your parents or grandparents catch COVID, you probably think to yourself, I wish it was me, not them. I wish it was me, not them. But actually, this innate desire of ours to bear the suffering of others is nothing new because it comes from the very heart of God. It comes from the very God's heart as Father. The big difference between God and us is this. God not only felt the same desire, I wish it was me, not you. The big difference is that God actually did bear our sins, our sicknesses, and our sufferings. Jesus, as God, really did die on our behalf. He wasn't helpless watching from afar. I wish I can do something about it. No, he stepped into time. Jesus stepped into time and he really bore everything on our behalf. That's the big difference. In the history of Christianity, some heretics, you know, they have tried to speculate that God in Christ Jesus didn't really die. Although to be fair, I must say, they weren't really caught heretics at the start. They were all genuinely trying to understand what God has done on the cross. But somewhere along the line, because of their theories, they were labelled by church fathers later on as heretics because they were not in line with biblical truth. But they started out with a good desire to try to explain what's happening. So some of the theories that they had put forth, for example, was, oh, Jesus didn't really die on the cross as God. Somehow at the last minute, there was a substitution. Somebody else died there instead of God. Or there was another theory. At the last minute, Jesus removed his spirit. So the person who died there, was purely human, not God. God didn't really die. So all of these were later on branded as heretics because they are not in line with biblical truth. Underlying all this, basically, they couldn't accept the fact that it was possible that this immutable, unchanging God could really die. How could God really suffer, stoop so low and die? So in their mind of thinking, in their eyes, no, cannot be. So God cannot die, and therefore they had to come up with some kind of theory. They didn't believe that God would stoop so low to become a human baby, take on human flesh, and to suffer such a humiliating death on the cross. In case you're not aware, scholars, historians tell us that the crucifixion is extremely cruel, humiliating way of execution. Instead of executing one straight away, like, you know, go to a guillotine, chop, psh, one second, settle. The crucifixion is a long and painful and humiliating process. The pain itself, physical pain, you can even hardly imagine, but it's bad with nails going through your arms, your feet. You already can kind of imagine how bad it is. And then with every breath, you have to push against all this pain just to breathe. Excruciating pain. But that's not just the, the end of the story. The Roman Empire used the crucifixion in a way to make a very strong political message as well. They will crucify the criminals at the busy road junctions, the highways of the ancient world, to give a very serious warning to everyone. Don't ever mess with the Roman Empire. This will be your fate. If you ever mess with us, this is what will be for you. And they will strip the victims naked quite often. Being naked is already quite humiliating, right? But now being stripped naked and hung on the cross for everyone who passes by to see. And so the cross, the crucifixion, is a very painful and humiliating death. And that's why some people couldn't accept the fact that God really did die. So they came up with all these other theories. It's not really God who died. But we Christians, on the other hand, have always held on to this simple but 
powerful reality that is enshrined in the Apostles' Creed, which we recite from time to time. I believe in God the Father, Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. These are the words we recite, and there's a huge history behind these few simple words. So the question is, why was God willing to stoop so low? Stoop so low to accept a death like that? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 tells us the answer. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of faith, for the joy set before Him. For the joy that was set before Christ, He endured the cross, scorning his shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And so we ask ourselves, what is this joy that was set before Jesus that he was willing to go through all this? What was his reward? What was he looking for? Well, for one, I believe it's us. Jesus died for you and for me. Remember what I said earlier? God not only felt the same desire, I wish it was me and not you. He really did take our place. He really did take our place. He took on our sin, our suffering, our sicknesses. He really did die on our behalf because of His great love for us. As simple as that reality is, having been a pastor for more than a decade now, I find that many Christians, you know, generally we find ourselves torn between two realities. On the one hand, we freely confess, yes, God loves me. We freely confess that. We even know John 3.16 so well, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, right? So we believe that. We know God loves us so much. Yet, on the other hand, we struggle to believe and trust God fully when God calls us to step out of the boat, to put our lives into His hands. Somehow, we have this lingering fear that God is out there to harm us. Do you have this same struggle? On one hand, you confess, yes, God, I know you love me. On the other hand, I'm not sure I can really trust you with all the daily you know, stuff in our lives. I find it quite ironic sometimes, you know, Think about this this way. Here we are, <clears throat> able to entrust to God this unknown, eternal reality. Huge, unknown, eternal reality. We say, okay, Jesus, you are my Savior. I believe you for this. And yet, when it comes to the small little things in our lives, we don't dare to trust Him. Give you an analogy. You ask the architect to build your wonderful palace, your house. You entrust this whole build project, big project to the architect. But then you tell the architect, I want to determine this particular screw, this particular light bulb. I don't care if everything is white. I want it mine here, orange. <laughs> There's a huge design here, <laughs> but we just want to meddle with that little bit without trusting God, who is this big architect, to take care even of the little details of our lives. Isn't it very ironic? We dare to entrust to God huge unknown reality. And yet, we cannot let go of that small little thing that actually is generally insignificant compared to eternity. Surely it should be the other way around, isn't it? <laughs> if we can trust God for this huge stuff, then we can trust God. Surely we can trust God even for the little things in our lives. And that's why Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount says, Hey, why are you worried? Don't you know your Father in heaven who cares for all the birds, the flowers, this whole world that is bigger, way bigger than all of us, if He can take care of all these big things, why are you so worried about these things, whether you have food or clothes? If you understand the big picture, you will definitely know that God is going to take care of you, even the little things. And so I pray for all of us that the Holy Spirit will really change, renew our minds, to see truth from the way God's Word really tells us. If God has demonstrated that He is willing to give up His entire life, let me say that again, entire life for us. He gave up His entire life for us. Why are we trying to steal a bit of what He can do for ourselves and not entrust our full lives, whole lives fully to Him? In his book, Our Bodies Tell God's Story, the author Christopher West reflects on the reward and the meaning of Christ's death. And he writes very powerfully, he reflects on the, the work of Christ on the cross. He says, Christ's life proclaims, you don't believe God loves you? Let me show you how much God loves you. How much God loves us. 
You don't believe that God is actually gift. This is my body given for you. You think God wants to keep you from life. And many of us in our life, we always at this journey, surely as Christians, we think, oh, you better don't obey God. Later he sent me to Timbatu, this kind of stuff, right? We think God wants to take life away from us. Listen, I will offer my life, myself, God's word says, so that my life's blood can give you life to the full. John chapter 10, verse 10, I've come that you have life and life abundant. You thought that God was a tyrant, a slave driver, because of our misconceptions, we may have been bullied, you know, abused by even by our own parents or others in authority. So we think that God is also this abusive authority figure. And we think that God is a tyrant, a slave driver. But Jesus says, I will take the form of a slave to show you I'm not a slave driver. I will let you lord it over me to demonstrate that God has no desire to lord it over you. You thought that God would whip your back if you gave him the chance? I will let you whip my back to demonstrate that God has no desire to whip yours. I have not come to condemn you, but to save you. I have not come to enslave you, but to set you free. Stop persisting in your unbelief. Stop persisting in your unbelief. Repent and believe the good news. Repentance is not saying sorry. In the Greek understanding, repentance is a change of our mind to see things differently. So repent and believe the good news. God is not here to torture us, but to set us free. By the way, this is the very basis why I put myself out there to pray for the sick, despite getting criticized from time to time. For me, two simple reasons. Jesus consistently demonstrated healing ministry in his life. Even if I don't fully understand everything, I still have my own theological struggles. He's my Lord. He set the example, I follow him. I don't fully understand, it's okay. He did it. He knows everything. I follow him. The other reason I pursue healing ministry is because I truly believe Jesus did pay the full penalty for our sins and our sicknesses. The full penalty. To those who think that maybe sicknesses are God's way to discipline us, do you know that actually you are going against the grain of Scripture? The grain of the Bible actually doesn't go in this direction at all. That God uses sicknesses to discipline and to punish us. Matthew chapter 7, again, Sermon on the Mount, Jesus taught very clearly, which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, you will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, and we must admit we are evil, we are sinful, we are fallen, compared to God's standard of goodness, we are evil. If we are evil, know how to give good gifts to our children. How much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask Him? How much more? It's a superlative comparative. If we are evil, know how to give good gifts to our children. You ask for bread, I give you bread. If we are able to do this, how much more is the goodness of the Father in heaven? Do we truly understand the Father's goodness? Are we going to attribute evil to God? I personally, I wouldn't dare to do so. You see, God's original will, His good, perfect, original will and intention is not death. Look at the Garden of Eden. God never intended for Adam and Eve to die. If He intended for Adam and Eve to die, He will not warn them. Why did he, what did He say to them? Don't eat of this fruit of the knowledge of tree of good and evil. Don't eat from this tree, the fruit. Because... On the day you eat of it, you will surely die. God loved them so much, He told them, don't eat this. I'm warning you, don't do it for your own good. My intention is not death for you. My intention is for life. So many other trees, eat anything. Don't eat this tree, okay? You will die. God's intention is very clear, never death from the beginning of time. <coughs> the only death, I would say, so called God intended, uh, even then I would put a limitation to that, was the death of His Son, Jesus. And even then, it's because of us. If we didn't fall, He didn't have to die. Death was not in God's original intention, but because of what has happened, He had to take our place. Jesus had to die to atone for our sins. Even as the, the dance was going on, you know, I was seeing it a second time, I realized it's us 
who hammered the nails into Jesus' body. It's not God who hammered the nails into His Son's body. It's us, sinful humanity, who crucified Christ. And if you read the Gospels, it's Satan who went into Judas Iscariot so that Judas Iscariot betrayed his teacher. So God is not the author of evil. He never intended for sin, sickness, suffering and death. And so I believe in the greatest demonstration that God's will is not death, is the resurrection. The resurrection tells us that God's ultimate revealed will is not death forevermore. If anybody got questions with that, arguments against me for that, look at the resurrection happening just in three days' time. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 26, Apostle Paul writes, The last enemy to be defeated is death. The last enemy to be defeated is death. If God calls death his enemy, <laughs> how can we call death our friend? Renew our minds, repent, and believe the good news. Death is called God's enemy. Death is painful, isn't it? Death is painful. Let's not trivialize death and its effects. Death is painful. I believe all of us sitting here, we have all lost the loved one before. Surely, we have experienced the pain of separation. Separation. Even if you know that they are you know, with God because they believe in Jesus, you cannot remove the pain of physical separation. The seat where this person used to be at the dining table, no more there. That physical separation is real. Death is real and it's painful. Death separates. That is the fundamental thing that death does. It separates us. That's why Jesus, even on the cross, he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Death puts a separation. That's why Jesus, uh, God, warned Adam, if don't eat it in the first place, not only will you die, you're going to separate us. So that is definitely not God's will. So death, sickness, sin are not the original intentions of God. Again, let's look at the Genesis account. When God created the whole world, what did He say on His own? This is good. This creation is good. And then after creating humanity, He says, very good. Not just good, no. Very good. Lagi bagus. Good. Super good. Right? Did He say it was bad and evil? No. His original intentions were good, are good. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8 tells us, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. The reason the Son of God appeared, that is Jesus, was to destroy the devil's work. What was the devil's very first work? He came to Adam and Eve in the garden. Oh, just eat lah. You will not die. It's a total lie. But nonetheless, they believe it. <laughs> but that's the devil's work. To deceive, to destroy, to kill. The reason the Son of God appeared is to destroy, to nullify the devil's work. Death is the work of the devil. Straightforward. Because the devil was the one who deceived and introduced death through Adam and Eve's disobedience. Now, hear me carefully. I'm not saying that we cannot learn anything from, you know, trials, sicknesses, and even death. Yes, there's much to learn from these things. And we should dare to confront them right, with God's grace. God often reveals a lot of Himself in these very difficult seasons of our lives. We can learn a lot of things. God can even do mighty things in the midst of evil. But it doesn't mean that God sent the evil. God intended the evil or sent the evil worse. I don't want to belabor this point, but later on when we study Joseph's life in the book of Genesis, his conclusion was what man intended for evil, God intended for good. He didn't say what God intended for evil, he eventually turned it around for good. He didn't say that. It's not God's intention for evil. It's man's intention for evil, but God is able to redeem anything and everything. So don't confuse. Don't be confused. The source and origin of evil is not God. His intention is always good. 
Again, the Lord's Prayer. We pray this so often. Our Lord teaches us, deliver us from evil. Deliver us from evil. Think again. If God the Father intended evil, then Jesus the Son teaches us, deliver us from evil. Isn't this a divine contradiction? And how can there be a divine contradiction between the Father and the Son? No way. Jesus cannot teach us something that is against the Father's will. Impossible. That's why we pray, Lord, deliver us from evil because it's not your intention, but you are giving us authority to begin to overcome evil in our world through prayer, the power of prayer. That's how we overcome evil, not with arms and weapons. It's prayer that we overcome and are delivered from evil. And so if Christ died for us, we ask ourselves this question, is his death insufficient to atone for all our sicknesses? If his death is sufficient to atone for our deaths, why is it not sufficient to atone for all our sicknesses? Are we going to put a limit to Christ's reward for his suffering? Oh, Christ, yeah, 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 you died for me. Okay, very good. You died for my sick, uh, death. Okay, very good. But you didn't die for my sickness. Are we going to put a limit around what God has done for us? The reward of His suffering is our holistic redemption, body, spirit, and soul. Are we going to say, oh, Jesus, you only died for my spirit. You didn't die for my body. Are we denying that this body is created, not created by God? No. You think about the implications of what we are thinking. When we say, God, you didn't die for my sickness, you died only for my sins. The full reward of Christ's suffering is the redemption of all of us. Body, spirit, and soul. Yes, this body will decay, will die, but there is a physical, spiritual, resurrected body that we are looking forward. It is not a ghost figure that we will inherit. It is a real body. We don't fully understand it, but it's going to be physical, material. The reward of his suffering then is all of us. That's the first point. I see all of you. I recognize most of you, if not all of you. I know you are mature Christians. You've been attending church. You've been growing in cell groups. So I can say this in love. I say this in love. Huh? This rebuke in love. Then generally, we try to share Christ with people, right? And then we tell them, believe in Jesus Christ. You will have eternal life. When you die, you go to heaven, correct? We always say that. Nothing wrong with that except that it's incomplete. It is not inaccurate, but it is incomplete. And so we put eternal life ahead of us. Whereas in John chapter 17, verse 3, Jesus says, this is eternal life. Not to go to heaven. Ah. The verse says that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And so we make this mistake. We tell people, believe in Jesus Christ, you will have eternal life when you die. We put eternal life in front. But this verse tells us the line of eternity is beside us. It's actually beside us. And so when we believe in Jesus Christ, we cross over from death to life. From darkness to light. From having no relationship with God because we are separated because of our sin. But the moment we believe in Jesus, we cross over. And now we have a relationship with God the Father and the Son. That is eternal life. I didn't come up with this definition. Jesus did. John chapter 17, verse 3. So salvation is not just a future matter. Yes, it's true. But it's also a now, present matter. Christ didn't just die to take us to heaven in the future. No, He rescued us for now too. We are supposed to experience His liberation and freedom now. We are, experience, we are supposed to experience the joy of salvation, the peace of salvation now. <laughs> Not just for the future. And we have the greatest privilege ever to come to God the Father now. You mean you're not going to say your prayers to God the Father until you go to heaven? No, surely not, right? So sometimes our actions contradict what we actually think and we need to repent our, and change our minds. We have a privilege to access fully through prayer to God the Father now. Again, we turn to the same high priestly prayer, John 17, the prayer that Jesus prayed. Verse 1, after he said this, he looked toward heaven and he prayed, Father, the hour has come, glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. 
For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Then he defines, now this is eternal life. I brought you, uh, they know you, the only true God, Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. So Jesus is happy. He finished the work. <laughs> and now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had in you before the world began. And so when you read Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 again, for the joy set before him, it is also possible, very likely, that Jesus saw this joy as returning to his Father. So my, my first point is, you know, Jesus' full reward of his suffering is us, our redemption, holistically, body, spirit, soul. We shouldn't be so self-absorbed, like, thinking it's all about us. It's not. <laughs> Jesus was looking forward to return to his Father's glory. The reward of his suffering is the glorious and joyful presence of his Heavenly Father. Do not underestimate, you know, Amokyo, Methodist Church family, the joy of God's presence. Remember, God exists as Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And they existed in his trinity before he even created time. Now think with me. If he existed for all eternity and he didn't have a single ounce of joy, <laughs> what kind of existence would that be? I preached this sermon last year. You can again go to the website or look for it in the podcast about God's holiness and happiness. They actually go hand in hand. We don't have to choose between the two. God is eternally happy. Otherwise, what's the point? <laughs> How can we go look forward to a heaven that is full of uh, this imagery of a God who is going to punish? That's totally wrong. Rather, as Scripture tells us, in His presence is fullness of joy. In His presence is fullness of joy. That's the joy that Jesus was looking forward to return to. That's why He endured the cross. On our part, we need to recognize our joy is contingent on knowing God. We try many things to make ourselves happy. You know, in this world, very various ways of entertainment, we try to make ourselves happy. But you know, after a while, this happiness dips, we sink low again. The only true source of everlasting joy is God Himself. There's no way we can derive a higher and more everlasting joy than God Himself. So joy comes for Jesus as he returns to his father, the one who loves him unconditionally, perfectly, and joyfully. And do you realize that's the, our new identity and reality too? This is our privilege. Would you believe me if I told you that we are loved by God as much as God loves Jesus, his son? Let me ask that question again, in case you didn't think about it enough. Would you believe me if I told you that you are loved in the same way that God the Father loved His Son, Jesus. Most of us struggle with that because we feel that our sins have, you know, uh, made us unworthy, we are undeserving. So we will never feel like, you know, we are loved as much as Jesus. If I were to ask you to raise your hands, do you believe God loves you? Everybody will say yes. Do you believe God loves His Son? Everybody will say yes. Do you believe that God loves you the same way He loved His Son, Jesus Christ? Then we are, uh, maybe not. I want to show you a Bible verse. It was, if it wasn't written in the Bible, I probably wouldn't believe it myself. But ever since I learned this verse, completely changed my mind, renewed my thinking. John chapter 17, again, same chapter. Jesus' prayer. My prayer is not for them alone, that is the first disciples. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them be one Father just as you are in me and I in them, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. And here's the part. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. That last phrase, you have loved them even as you have loved me. In the Greek, this verse 23 is the same word, agape, the root word. Some of us know there are different words for love in the Greek language. There's agape, unconditional love. There's phileo, friendship love. There's storge, family love. And there's eros, you know, romantic love. It's the same word, agape. God loves Jesus unconditionally, agape love. God loves us. Same word, agape, 
unconditional love. It's not God, agape Jesus, huh? then phileo us, friendship, love only, lower level. If that were the case, I would preach that to you. But it's not. It is the same unconditional love. We are loved at the same level as Jesus. Again, you think about it. Can God do anything less? Can the God of unconditional love not love unconditionally for everyone? Of course not, because it is His nature. And so what this means in practical terms, in terms of implication, is this. Jesus not only died to give us a relationship with the Father. He didn't just die to give us a relationship. But He died to give us His kind of relationship with the Father. I'm going to let that truth sink in for a while. But this is very important. He didn't die just to give us a relationship, you know. But to, we are at the same level as Jesus. The same kind of relationship and intimacy that Jesus enjoyed is available for all of us. To put it differently, Christ didn't die so that you can become second class, third class, fourth grade Christian, son of God, daughter of God. Oh, there's the first grade Jesus, everybody else second grade, or fourth grade, or tenth grade. No. We are given the same privilege, access as Jesus. That is the full reward of His suffering. Point number two, the free reward, free, full reward of Christ's suffering is a fully restored and reconciled relationship with God the Father now. In the same manner that Jesus knows the Father, it is available to us now. We really need to get this into our heads, in our spirits. There were two young Moravian missionaries by the name of Dover Nishman. They were called by God in 1732 to minister to African slaves on the islands of St. Thomas, St. Croix, or if you are French, maybe it's pronounced Sakwa. They went to Danish uh, West Indies. So the legend, as it were, the, allegedly, they sold themselves as slaves in order to reach the slaves. And as they were sailing away from the docks, they called out to their loved ones on the shore, may the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. May the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. The people out there, Christ died for them. I'm going to die, I'm going to serve as a missionary to bring this reward, people, back to God. So that's, the, I think, the over-romanticized version that he, they became slaves to reach the slaves. More likely, the two missionaries strongly exerted they were willing to become slaves if there was no other way. But unfortunately, the court officials didn't allow them. The court officials said, it is impossible. It is not allowed. White men cannot become slaves. That's the kind of prejudice at the time, okay? It's just a historical fact. We don't want to judge them, but that's the reality. So the long story cut short, after some difficulty, they finally got some approval from the Danish queen herself in the court, and they managed to set sail. So they didn't work as slaves, but they worked as carpenters. And they lived frugally, and they ministered to the slaves. After two years, they left, and other Moravian Christians did the work of missions, and it's reputed that the Moravian missionaries baptized 13,000 converts before any other missionaries came. May the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. This courageous quote by the Moravian Christians is where I got the inspiration for today's sermon. And in case you don't know your history, your Methodist history, the Moravian Christians were instrumental in influencing the life of John Wesley. Their piety, their fervor for the Lord. They had a 100-year unbroken prayer chain, sending out the most number of missionaries ever. This piety, this fervor for the Lord. Because they realize that Christ's reward of his suffering at the end of the day is every single human soul. Every single human soul is the right reward that Jesus deserves. So what's this joy that, you know, said before Jesus that he was willing to undergo this humiliation of the cross? First of all, it's for our full redemption. Body, spirit, soul. Second, for him, the joy of returning to God the Father. But I think above all this is this, the last point, for everyone, others. 
that everyone can have a restored, reconciled relationship with God, not just a few privileged people, certain race, certain economic status. No, it's everyone. That is the reward we are supposed to bring to Jesus. I'm very passionate about today's sermon because I'm preaching to myself. I realize I fall far short of this sermon, way far short in my devotion to Christ, in my evangelistic fervor. I'm preaching passionately to myself. Don't think I've got any moral high ground above all of you. I have none. But I preach it because that is the word of God. May the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. Now, what would it look like if all of us really took this message seriously, the death of Christ seriously? We can no longer be pew warmers. Just sitting there, our lives unchanged. Oh, it's a good message. I'm just going to continue doing my own things. If we truly understand the implications of Christ's death, we can never live the same again. I just want to offer, as we close, a few reflection pointers, application points, how we will live life differently. We should live life differently. That Jesus will reward, receive the full rewards of his suffering. First of all, we will view ourselves and others very differently. We will no longer look at ourselves and others in the same way. All these negative perceptions, you know, like disgust, dishonor, disrespect, all these bad tempers, as John Wesley would call them, bad affections, will be thrown out of the window because Jesus paid the full price for our redemption. How can we look at ourselves with self-pity any longer? Some of us like to wallow in self-pity. Eh? <laughs> oh, we are the worst, uh, we are the worst. Actually, do you know that's pride? Because you're focused on yourself and you think that God cannot save you. I'm the worst, I'm the worst. <laughs> that is not the right way you should see yourself any longer. Again, repent and believe the good news. We are loved by God, full stop, because of Him. Nothing to do with whether we have done our quiet time that day or done a good deed or not. We will see ourselves differently. We will see others differently. You know, in our human flesh, we have judgments of people. Oh, yeah, this guy, terrible, I can't stand him. Whatever reasons they may be, you know, for to not like this person. And maybe you're right, this person has done terrible things. But if we truly understand this message, we recognize actually we have no right to judge or to condemn anyone. Because God loves them as much as He loves us. There is no second class love for them and higher class love for us. We will no longer condemn others with a judgmental, critical eye. And in case you're worried, oh, this is so self-centered love, we love ourselves. I tell you, if you truly understand God's love, it will never ever be a proud, snobbish kind of love. It will always be a humble, gentle love. That's when you truly understand the love of God. Not higher class kind of love, but gentle, humble love. May God so fill our hearts that we see ourselves and see others differently, in a good way, forever. Second implication, we will take our salvation very seriously. And this is really the fundamental call as Methodists. The Methodists, yes, they were methodical. That's why they were given this name, right? But at the heart of it, they were people who diligently pursued inward holiness. After the revival meetings, John Wesley, in order to make sure that these disciples did not lose their faith, got trapped into the world again, but sucked back in by temptation, he put them into class meetings so that they can work out their salvation. That's the whole intention of behind the class meeting is for accountability, not so much to make sure that, wow, oh, you know, you must prove yourself by good works. No, it's because we've been handed this great treasure. I must handle it, precious treasure. I'm not going to waste, and trivialize this salvation because Christ died the full reward of suffering, how can I trivialize it and throw it under the, under the ground and trample it and like throw pearls to the pigs? We will take our salvation seriously. John Wesley repeatedly reminded the Methodists, Hebrews chapter 12 verse 14, and remind us, make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy, for without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. This is a strange pairing, actually. 
Normally, what do you pair with peace? Joy. <laughs> what do you normally pair with holiness? Righteousness. Okay? How come uh, these two are paired together here? Today's sermon actually reveals the link. If you understand Christ's worth, the work that He has done on the cross, we will see everyone differently, right? And when you see everyone differently, the way Christ sees them, what will you do? You will strive to keep the peace because Christ died for them as well as for you. You hurt them, you are hurting the, what Christ has done. That's why you strive to live for peace because you remember what Christ has done. At the same time, you will not ever waste your, you know, your own time and whatever because you want to be holy. Christ died to purchase our holiness. That's why Hebrews 12, 14, make every effort to live in peace with one another and holiness. The same root, Jesus' death. Point number three, reflection and application point. We will enter into God's presence more frequently. Treasure the times that we have with God a lot more. No longer will we see doing devotions quiet time as a chore or as a spiritual discipline. And I must say, there is a wonderful place for spiritual discipline because knowing ourselves, we tend to slack off. Even like exercising, right? We know it's good for us, but we don't do it because lazy. Yeah. <laughs> so discipline is good. It forces us to do things against our own will. Right? We use our willpower so-called as able to overcome the other side of our will to do exercise. And so there's a place for spiritual discipline as well. When you don't feel like it, you will do it. But I hope and pray that we will begin to see this larger reality. God is calling us and drawing us in because now we have full access as Jesus did to the Father's presence. That we are loved as much as Jesus was loved by Father, by Father God. And so when we miss our devotional times, you know, our corporate worship times, we shouldn't feel guilty. We should feel hungry. We should feel thirsty. There should be a longing. It's not about checking to-do lists, mark attendance. All this superficial, I think, as well. If it helps you, good, do that. But the real motivation has to be love for God. Because God loves us so much. When we miss these things, our devotional times, it should create a hunger, a longing. I pray for all of us that God will enable us once again to return to our first love. Finally, last reflection point. We who have been beneficiaries of so great a treasure, we cannot keep this to ourselves. We must share what Christ has done. God's love. We must share it boldly. We who have tasted and seen that the Lord is good. We must tell everyone, hey, God loves you. Do you know there are actually a lot of people who don't like themselves? They don't love themselves. On the outside, they may appear really snobbish, terrible, evil. But they are inside, they may not even like themselves, the, be the person that they are. Yeah, but because we are so put off by them, we don't even want to talk to them. But if this were the case, who's ever going to reach them? So we must surely tell everyone of this good news, even those who are dark, even to the darkest of their core. They may not even know what they're doing. <laughs> we tell them there is hope, there is redemption, there is life in Christ Jesus. You can be different from who you are now. There is a whole new, exciting change, turnover in your life, both now and for eternity. Once you come to know Jesus, this God who loves you so much. So we must seize every opportunity, just as the Moravian Christians did, to proclaim Christ, even to the slaves. People who are seen as outcasts don't deserve it, but they wait to preach the gospel. May we all do the same. May the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. May the lamb that was slain receive the full reward of his suffering. Come, let us pray. Lord, I first make my own confession. I fail to live out even this message. 
but yet I'm called to preach this message. Forgive my hypocrisy. But Lord, this is your truth. I cannot change it. And so, Father, I pray not just for your forgiveness, but for your empowerment that I may begin to live it. I pray for all of us too. You stir in our spirits. You change our minds. You give us no rest until we begin to see this come to pass to fruition. That Christ truly may receive the full reward of His suffering. We pray, Father, I want to pray that truly the words that have been preached will not be stolen, taken away by the evil one because that's his work to steal. Father, I pray for good soil, for our hearts to be good soil, that your word will take root and grow and bear fruit and bring life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.